the goal of our session today is to shine light on an initial pathway for those who are new to the world of research. Um, a quick note I'm just going to slip in over here is that because this session is online, there's always a chance of technical difficulties. If there's an occurrence, uh, you're requested to stay with us and you'll be kept updated on the WhatsApp group. Um, our speaker today is none other than the guru himself, Professor Asif Qureshi. For those of you who don't already know, he's the professor of pathology, the director of Dow Labs, and a consultant of molecular pathology. He also heads the Dow Cancer Registry. And along with all of that, he has 40 national and international publications, and he's also an editor and a reviewer in several high-ranking international journals. His passion to pass on his knowledge is also reflected on his YouTube channel, where he regularly posts extremely helpful medical videos. Uh, participants here reminded that you can send in your relevant questions on the WhatsApp group. Uh, we've dedicated the last 15 minutes of this session uh, just for answering your questions. Um, Professor Qureshi, welcome to the Care Research Insiders Workshop. We are delighted to have you here today. How are you doing? Thank you very much, Ari. Pleasure is all mine indeed. And welcome to all the participants. And I hope this one hour session is going to be very propitious for all of us. And I should also congratulate CARES for arranging such a fantastic meetup. It's not an easy task, and I really appreciate students coming up, you know, and taking over. Because in today's world, you guys must acknowledge that research is something that is a must for medical students, you know. Whether it's um, for your promotions or your residencies abroad or whatever, research is an integral component that you need to learn. So once again, congratulations, Kier, for arranging such a fantastic platform and welcome to all participants. Thank you so much. It is an honor. All right. So without further ado, let's get straight to our topic. Um, so since our session today is directed towards students, for just taking their first steps into the world of research. We're gonna start with the very basics. So um, in your view, what is medical research? So um, that's, that's a very good question and, and I agree it's a very basic question. Now, we should all understand, particularly the students, that when we see and use this word medical research, that basically means a research that focuses on a medical problem on a problem which is a real problem of the society. For example, if, if we talk about in terms of Pakistani perspective. So in Pakistan, what are the major medical problems? What are the major health burdens? So we talk about infectious diseases. We talk about tuberculosis. We talk about dengue fever. We talk about cancers, hypertension, diabetes. So any research answering any questions related to the major healthcare burden of any population is what we define medical research as. And the research should be for important medical problems. I mean, think about this. You, in research, you spend quite a lot of resources. You spend quite a lot of human resource. You spend quite a lot of money, budgets and grants from the government. So there is much resource involvement. And if you want to spend that resource on a disease which is extremely super duper rare, that's a waste of money. So medical research by definition is a research focusing on major healthcare medical problems. All right, that was very comprehensive. Uh, or now that we know what research is, could you tell us about its importance both in the context of medical knowledge as well as a student's career? All right, so you rightly pointed out there are two contexts, you know, um, one is why is it important for students and the other one is why is it really important in terms of generating knowledge. So we all belong to universities, for example, you are studying in a university, I'm teaching as a faculty in a university, so one of the major tasks of a university is to generate knowledge. And the only way to generate knowledge is via research. So any society you know it, it builds its knowledge innovations inventions and new therapeutic approaches all based on the research if you don't do medical research i mean think about this we had COVID crisis you know a couple of years ago and the rapid response from the researcher was the only response which led us 
you know, uh, being made as enabled as having vaccines, having the diagnostic test for COVID. If there was no research, I mean, imagine a world without research. So without research, no vaccination would have been possible. No diagnostic test would have been possible. So that's the contribution towards the society. That's the contribution towards generating new knowledge. Now, as far as the students are concerned, guys, this is very important for you these days because now um, let's take an example of one of the very famous exam which is students wish to undertake usmle for example there are different steps of usmle and step one used to be a score based examination which no more is the scenario step one is just a pass fail you still get a score in step two and step one is just a pass fail so everyone would pass or fail all those who passed are in one boat now you should have some you know extra gadgets with yourself what the program directors are now going to look at is your cv what is your research portfolio have you worked with a research team have you published a paper have you answered a major research question so that's going to be very important uh, for the students yourselves guys and also as far as the contribution towards the society is designed you know research builds nations up research uh, solves questions it is very important for healthcare so uh, i would say since i'm a very passionate researcher myself i would say there's no life without research right uh, i think the covid example that you gave is really something that all of us can relate to immediately and um, about the usmle we also have a lot of participants here who plan to go abroad after graduating so I'm sure that was very helpful for those who do aspire to go abroad. All right, uh, so now that we're um, over the basics, let's take a quick dive into the research paper itself. Uh, first of all, what are the main steps of a research project? So um, for this purpose, as you already told the participants that um, I do upload quite a lot of uh, videos on my YouTube channel. So there is a designated detailed video for uh, research starters like yourself, students in first year or second year. So there is a very detailed video, more than half an hour long video, which talks about different steps of research. Here we can talk about them very quickly, that what is the first step, how do you start, what are the basic, uh, you know, uh, small footsteps to start the research. Now, the first thing to start research, guys, is, believe me or not, to find the right mentor. That's the first step. So once you know, so look in your vicinity, look in your surrounding. Since you are all at the very junior level, you are in your undergrad curriculum, first year, second year, third year students. I assume no one is uh, post grad here. Is that correct, Ari? They are all undergrad yeah, students. Is, yeah, we're all undergrad here. So yeah, so uh, all the undergrad students, you need a mentor, you need a good coach, and that's the first thing to do. Once you identify the coach, you guys should sit down together to identify relevant questions that you can answer in available resources. I understand that all of you are undergrad students. You do not have um, all time in life to do research. You have to do your modular curriculum and give your exams and everything. You have to study very hard. Besides that, you have to spend some time on research. So your research questions should be doable. It should be a research that, you know, uh, you may become part of a broader research group where different projects are ongoing and you play your small footstep in there and you, uh, you know, are a contributor to solve the bigger puzzle. And this is how you learn the step. So the first step would be to identify the mentor. The second step would be to identify the topic, what is doable. And as we say, it should be a smart topic. When we say spark topic, it should be a specific, which means a relevant medical research question. It should be a measurable topic, measurable objective. It should be easily doable. It should be resource wise, feasible, all these sort of things. Now, once you have decided a topic, now the first thing to do is identify the objectives. What do you want to do? In every research, that's the first thing you decide. For example, I founded a cancer registry in Dow University of Health Sciences back in 2014. So that was a research project. I had to establish a cancer registry with the idea that my research question was one, that why do I need to found this registry? What will be the purpose? And the purpose was, we do not know the cancer statistics within the city. 
So we being a big government setup, we being a big university, it is our responsibility to establish something where we can answer. For example, what is the most common cancer in males in Karachi? What is the most common cancer in females in Karachi? What is the most lethal cancer in Karachi? So these are the questions which are now answered by the Dow Cancer Registry. So you identify the mentor, you decide the topic, and then you identify your objectives. Once your objectives are laid down, and it should be very, very specific objective. See, this is not enough to decide, I want to do research on breast cancer. Okay, but what do you want to do? I want to do research. But what do you want to do? What I'm trying to convey is that your research objective should be very, very specific. And that will be done with the help of your mentors. This is why you need good mentors, okay? So once the objectives are decided, then you decide the methodology. Methodology for different types of research varies. It's different for experimental research, it's different for analytical research, it's different for uh, survey-based research. And again, this will be then the expertise of your mentor to guide you that for your research objectives, what is the methodology that you need to pursue? And once you decide the methodology, you conduct your experiments. Now, those experiments can be in the laboratory. Those experiments can be even filling a questionnaire is an experiment. You take the questionnaires to the public, they get it filled. That's an experiment that you are doing. And once you have done your experiment, you generate data. You now have data. And that data you input into the softwares, you analyze the data, you conclude your data, you get your results uh, analyzed, and now you, you know, uh, what we say is deduce conclusions. That that was my research question. These were my objectives. This is what I did. This is what I found. And this should be your future direction. So that's the basically overall picture, overall algorithm of how the research works. All right. Those were very well explained steps. Thank you for that. Uh, so now that we have that done, uh, could you explain to us the basic structural parts of a research paper? Yeah, so uh, research paper again comes in different flavors and um, the most authentic one is what we call the original article. When we say original article, that means that's a research article where somebody followed the steps that I just told you, that they decided their objectives, they decided their methodology, and they conducted the experiments, and now they have all the results ready, and they published them as a research paper. So that original article or research paper usually have these components. Abstract. Abstract is a brief of what they did. It's usually 250 words or 300 words, not more than that. And there the scientist tells the world that this is in summary what I've done. And after the abstract, there is an introduction. In introduction, they usually introduce their topic. They talk about the problems they have solved. They talk about the knowledge gap they are going to address. And that introduction is then followed by materials and methods where they explain their methodology. This is followed by results section that, hey, this is what I did and these are my results. Now, these results are also represented in the form of graphs, for example, in the form of figures, for example, in the form of tables, for example. So these are all uh, results, okay? And after the results, um, usually a research article contains um, discussion. And in discussion, scientists usually discuss their results in light of what is already available in the literature. So I did experiment A, and there was another scientist who did a similar experiment. I found this, but they found this. So this could be the reason for the similarities that the two research groups have got, or the dissimilarities that the two research groups have got. So that kind of thing, you know. So abstract, introduction, materials and methods, results, discussion, conclusion, and references. These are the different parts. Okay, since we're on the writing and the structure of the research, uh, could you please explain to us the importance of referencing and citation and what they mean? So referencing and citation basically means, so research is kind of, it's, it's, it's like a wall that, that is made up of brick upon brick upon brick upon brick, that sort of thing. So if I'm, I'm doing an experiment, for example, and that experiment includes uh, giving patient X, drug A, dose this. So if I'm using a particular drug in a particular dose and giving it to a patient, there must be a reference to this. 
For example, somebody else must have investigated the same drug. Somebody else must have used the same dose. So if I'm using a dose, I should cite to somebody's work. If I don't, then I'm doing kind of in research, we call it um, research crime, which is what we call plagiarism. Now, plagiarism is something also very, very important where you use and quote somebody else's work without citing it. So that's basically a research crime type of thing. And I would request the CARE platform to arrange a hands-on workshop. Maybe they acquired a digital library or some platform, something like that, where we can show you how to check plagiarism. There are softwares, how to improve plagiarism. Copy pasting would not work, guys. It's not good to copy from one paper and paste in your paper. It's a no, no research doesn't work like this. Okay. So whenever you are citing somebody's work, you are a good researcher. If you are writing it, but not citing it, citing means quoting somebody's work. Okay. And you do that in the form of a reference. So this citation is very important. Otherwise, if you enter the world of plagiarism, that's a crime. Right. I think the idea of the plagiarism workshop is great because it's indeed a very extensive and important part uh, so uh, we'll make sure our team looks into that um, now that uh, we have our research structure done we have it written uh, what is the importance and what does it mean to get a research paper published all right this is very important uh, regardless of whatever career of your um, studies you are so if you publish a research as i said twofold one you are contributing to the society so whatever research paper you have published is definitely containing some novel data you have got something new you say for example if you're working in the field of breast cancer your research paper has contributed to the field of breast cancer so maybe it's a small piece of information but it is a small piece in the bigger jigsaw puzzle where you are contributing to you know get uh, the breast cancer cracked down whether it's diagnostic therapeutic or prognostic you know, depends upon what type of research we have done but that is contributing towards a major health problem that's one benefit other one what we call is as a personal benefit think about yourself if you graduate um, in say for example 2025 or 2026 and you have got five research papers published that's, you know, a lot of feathers in your cap. When you go to any hospital for your postgraduate training and you show them their CV, that it's not, the, it's not only the MBBS that I have done. Uh, I mean, alongside my MBBS, I have been very busy doing research, published five papers. So you, you have no idea. So I interview, for example, a lot of postgraduate students, those who are aspiring to enter in my postgraduate training. And if I look at a CV, something like this, that a guy has got three papers published, wow, which means that he now has the understanding of the whole research and this person. So if you publish a few papers in your undergrad, you will bring important values to their postgraduate residency program, wherever you go. And the program directors looks at, you know, you are the guy to take into the residency. Now, if it's a national residency program, we love to take students who have done research. If it's an international resident, they love it even more. So I always take about talk about examples like United States residency, for example. So if you've done your USMLE with a few papers published, big thing, it's a big deal, and they welcome you with open hands and open hearts. Okay. So guys, it, it's must, and this is the right time. If you are in first year or second year, attached to some mentors, and I should be happy to facilitate you guys via the care platform because these guys have been working very hard to you know facilitate students to upscale their learning databases and skills databases so contact care people and they will connect you guys with me so i'm happy to accommodate as much students as i can so attach to mentors and start your research okay this is the right time all right thank you very much so we see that this was also uh, involved in the two contexts one had the medical knowledge and the other is the personal benefits um, so do you think that um, a research paper is uh, meaningless if it's not published? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. So in, in research world, we use this phrase called publish or perish. So if you don't publish, uh, you, will, you will have a lot of people in your life, guys, who will talk about, oh, I've done a lot of research on this topic and then topic. 
And if you ask them, have you published it? Can I can I search you on PubMed? Do you exist on PubMed? PubMed is the international database where the international research is those which have been published. They they are present there. You can just Google on and for example, you just open the website PubMed, type my name, for example, Muhammad Asif Qureshi, and you will find my papers, whatever I have published. So this is how you know that if a scientist is publishing something, is it appearing on the international listing or not? So if I'm not publishing, that means I'm only talking, 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 doing nothing. You know, that sort of thing. So um, remember, right from the very early stages of your medical career, inculcate this in within yourself you know that you don't only you i don't want my students to become those students who only talk about research i want to do research i love research i cannot live without research but at the end of the day i publish nothing absolutely meaningless two two things here one you have to publish it that is for sure and number two you have to publish it good now when i say you have to publish it good that basically means that do not select a crappy journal for your research paper. So the journal that you select for your publication should have an impact factor, should be listed in PubMed. Again, these are all discussed in, in a video that is already available on my YouTube channel. So you just go to YouTube, type Asif Qureshi, and the channel should come up and look for the research video. So there I tell the students about how do you select the right journal it should have an impact factor. It should be available on PubMed. Otherwise, if you have done so much hard work and you publish your paper in a journal which nobody knows about. So what's the purpose of research? The purpose of research is that to show the world that, hey, guys, I've done this and that's my contribution in the field of breast cancer. So if anybody else doing any research in the field of breast cancer must read your paper, then you are then you have the feeling of that I've contributed. Otherwise, if you publish it somewhere which nobody reads, then there will be no contribution. There will be no, uh, you know, sense of satisfaction to yourself. So not only that you have to publish, but you have to publish it good. Right. So that was a very hard no, that it is not important if you don't publish it. So do keep that in mind, researchers here. Um, so uh, we do have a lot of uh, first and actually I'm just going to say one thing in the middle. Um, uh, participants, we touched upon um, these different terminologies, impact factor and journals. And of course, we, we're limited by time over here. But uh, if you're interested in finding out more about these, do check out his YouTube channel. Um, absolutely uh, informative and great videos there. Uh, if you have any doubts about these terms, you'll, you'll be cleared. I'm sure you will. Uh, so moving on, um, we have a lot of first and second year medical students here and they want to start research. What would you say to them? What, what, what are the main things that they should keep in mind before they're getting in? So um, again, so as I said, you know, now, now everything is integrated. Now you would relate to our earlier part of the conversation where we talked about what are the steps of the research. So what did I tell you? What was the first step? The first step was to identify the right mentor. So the first thing to keep in mind would be that identify the right mentor. So for example, you will find a lot of people around who will tell you that guys, come on, let's do research. I have interest in brain cancer, this cancer, this disease and that disease. It's your job guys to check out the profile of the mentor. Now, obviously, how would you check the profile of the mentor? You're not going to ask the mentor, sir, can you please give me your CV? I would like to have a look at your CV. No, you can't do that. But there are other ways. Just go on PubMed, type his name. If the person has never published, it's the wrong mentor for you. The person who has not done it cannot teach you that. That's simple as that, okay? Even, even our Quran says that ask those who know it. So the first thing to keep in mind would be when you are choosing the mentor, do not get influenced by anything. Get influenced by the work that the guy has published. So that's the first thing. So if you have picked up the right guy or girl, whatever, <laughs> include both the genders, I'm not singling out anyone. So if you have found out the right mentor, your life will be easy and rest of the steps will be sorted. He or she will be there to guide you through each and every single step. That what is the best research? For example, when first year students come to me, 
expressing their interest. That's how we are interested in research. I don't take them to my laboratory where I do DNA extraction and do generic sequencing. I don't expect first year students to you know, do that sort of research, never not even second year students maybe in final year i i may be involving some final year students in extracting dna from the cancer tissues and doing genetic analysis but first year and second year usually what we do is dry research when we say dry research that basically means now is the time of databases so I take this to sit down with me. I'll show you a couple of databases where there is a lot of genome sequences available. I tell them how to analyze those data. So everything on computer. So we divide the task and then they are learning in a small packets, a small quanta. And at the end of the day, when you join all those pieces, they've got a research complete. So the research should be doable at the level of whatever you are in your medical studies. A first year student will not be doing advanced research. That is for a PhD student, for example. A first year student can easily do the survey type of research, questionnaires or database type of research. So that is another thing to keep in mind. If somebody is talking to you that you have to do laboratory work, that's something not for you at the moment. That's another thing. Then the other thing to keep in mind is whenever you are talking to a mentor, always talk about the timelines that, OK, now we are starting this research. When will our objectives be finalized? What will we do in the next few weeks? When will be the first draft of the paper ready? When are we planning to submit? You have to be that concrete with your mentor. Otherwise, if you go there, I want to do research and you spend two years doing the research and after two years, you do not have a paper. And after the third year, I mean, you will yourself forget about what you did in the first year. So these are the things you need to take into account that you join the group and in six to eight months time, you should have your paper submitted, which will take another four to six months to publish. But at least it should be submitted four or six months from the date that you joined. And as I said, if you take the first step correctly, which means that you choose the right mentor, the rest of the steps will be taken care of. OK. All right. So what we extract from that is that getting the right mentor is the most important thing that juniors can do here. All right. Um, right. So uh, now that we've talked about the first and second years, um, the ones 30 years onwards, the people who are attending clinical postings, uh, how can they benefit from this opportunity they're getting to spend time in the hospitals uh, in terms of research? Yeah, so um, I'll share my own example. When I was doing my third year, and that was the first time I thought about research, that um, nowadays the awareness about research is comparatively more than uh, actually used to be in our times. I graduated in 2005, so I'm talking about 2003. I mean, it's been almost two decades from today. At that time, research in undergraduate was, was not you know, well taken up by the students. But I thought of it, you know, that what, what can we do? I mean, what, why, these sort of questions. The first thing I did was in my ward, that was a surgery ward, what I did was I talked to my professor and I gathered all the registers in front of me in a table. And those registers had a note of what were the you know nature of patients who are admitted in the emergency, nature of patients who are admitted in the O via the OPD, and what was the treatment given, when was the patient discharged, if there was mortality, how many patients died. And I compiled six months data. And that was huge data. It's a public sector. I did my all rotations. I'm a graduate from Dow Medical College. So I did all my rotations in civil hospital, also my internship in civil hospital. So it's a public sector hospital. And you can imagine the amount of workload that you get in a public sector hospital. So I had a lot of register, pile of register. And I went through all of them and put them in an Excel sheet. And after six months, I presented this to my professor that in your ward, in the last six months, this is the number of hernia cases. This is the number of gallbladder cases. This is the number of laparotomy cases. Out of this much laparotomy, this is the number of patients who died. This is the number of patients who went home without any complication. So this is all what I did in my third year. Then we managed to publish it in my fourth year. I, what I'm trying to tell you is that when you are in wars, that's the least you can easily do. I mean, talk to your professor that I have an idea. Let's do an audit of the ward about the type of patients that we treated. And nowadays, back in 2003, it was the registers. Now it's all in the, in the computer systems. 
we all have the software uh, with us and the hospital databases are there so that is the least which the clinical uh, students starting from 30 or 40 or final year they can do and that's the first thing they actually should do they should talk to the professor in every ward you are gynecology or whatever ward you are you should do this as your first step in the clinics all right um so uh, a lot of us here are uh, in second or third year and uh, now we're now we're getting into this research thing but as we know um uh, doing med school is it's not impossible but it's not easy either uh, so what portion of a student's time should be dedicated towards this and how should they manage it? I think yeah, yeah, it's a very it's a very pertinent question that is not easy because you already have a very tough curriculum to follow on and very busy days that you have in the medical school. But I think if you spend uh, and, and believe me on that, I'm I'm talking out of experience and I've done this with the undergrad students before. If you spend three to four hours a week. And that's manageable, that's doable. That's something that you can easily take out from your whatever busy schedule, three to four hours a week for a persistent six months, and you should have your paper ready. That's that's I'm talking out of experience. We have done on this, you know, formula before with the students that the first meeting that I do with the students is a bit comprehensive. We spend about an hour in the first meeting deciding what will be the objectives of the paper, of the research, and then afterwards you Usually, it's remote work. You're working from home. Uh, we are talking to the students via internet on emails, giving them tasks. They are doing the tasks and sending back me the files, all that sort of thing. So three to four hours a week for six months is good. Okay, so now we've gone through the timing and how we will write it and all of that. So uh, in today's world, is it necessary to take courses or attend classes that are uh, about research before getting into anything? Yeah, so it's, it's always a good idea to acquire new knowledge and skills and uh, luckily and fortunately there are so many very good courses available nowadays free of cost course era is one big platform and what not I mean you just go to net and there are so many courses but the downside of this is do not uh, you know get yourself grabbed in attending so many courses research courses that at the end of the day you are only attending courses and not doing research. So you should have a balance between the number of courses that you want to attend. So for example, you should have basic understanding of what is research, what are the research steps, watch a couple of videos here and there, and then you are good. After this, you should identify a mentor and the mentor will guide you. Obviously, you will need software helps. For example, there's a software called SPSS. And again, uh, we have conducted these uh, workshops before uh, so many times and CARE can conduct this as well. And I'm happy to facilitate at all by all means to these students because they, they have a mission, you know, they, they are spending their time, they are investing their time, their resources, their energy, all those, you know, around 100 participants who are attending at the moment. Uh, I would like to tell them that these guys have been working very hard for arranging, you know, uh, this one meeting. So you can arrange SPSS workshops for these students. So yes, there are a number of courses that you should take, but you should not overburden yourself with the amount of courses that you are taking. So a few basic courses and then you are good to go and then do the research yourself because it's like driving. You cannot learn driving just by watching somebody drive. You have to drive yourself if you want to learn how to drive, okay? So if you keep on watching courses and videos, how to conduct research, you're not gonna learn it. You're not gonna learn this skill unless you do research yourself. Okay, thank you. Your appreciation really means a lot to us. Uh, but um, following on from that question, uh, is there a certain set of skills or tools that uh, one needs to have before starting research? So, yeah, yeah, I think there's a basic requirement and one uh, at the top of my list would be uh, to have good understanding of Microsoft Office, including Excel. Excel is a very powerful tool, not only for routine analysis, but also for some statistical analysis. 
and it it sounds like oh what is across if talking about excel is something so basic we all know how to use excel but believe me there are so many hidden functions that students usually don't know about excel so you should you should master how to use uh, microsoft excel word obviously you should know because you will at the end of the day writing your research paper and powerpoint because you will be generating a lot of figures and images and graphs so microsoft office is something that you should master that's one thing now pertaining to research analysis there is one software for which you should definitely attend courses that is spss spss is something which is very routinely used for research and uh, actually i conducted uh, recently i conducted a remote course on spss all those videos are also freely available on my website uh, also on the youtube channel if you want to have a look so spss is something that students should learn as well then uh, there are some softwares which deals with the images and photographs one of them for example is adobe photoshop you should have basic understanding of that software because you for your research paper you will be generating some figures and some graphs and you will be liking you know you have to present your data in a much more um, you know pleasant way in a way that it is more publishable it is more appreciated so for that you need all those tools okay but if you are good with microsoft office if you are good with spss and excel then i think you are good to go to start the research at least right okay so we can't just go out there and get into it. We need a basic uh, set of skills. Um, so uh, now that we've, uh, we've uh, gone across that, um, let's say someone just attended this workshop. Now they're motivated, pumped. They're leaving their room. They want to do research. What is the first step? You said uh, getting the right mentor is very important. But um, let's say I'm, I'm living in the dorms at DIMC. Now I get out. There's a range of mentors everywhere. There are 500 rooms in that one building alone. Everyone's on to some research. What's that first step that we need to take to get in? So you have already taken the first step. For all those who are attending this workshop, their first step was to get connected with care. And care, I'm sure, will carefully take care of them. So. <laughs> And, and and care care has already been in touch with me for example now every connection is a transaction every connection in a transaction in a sense that you tap a range of resources when you tap one single connection for example so all those participants who are attending this workshop or this uh, meeting they they are now in touch with the care people and care people are in touch with 10 more people for example, myself, I'm in touch with 20 more people. So that's how you build up the network. And I think all of you have taken the first step. Now the next step would be for all those who are attending this workshop or who are going to watch our video later on, the recorded video, the first step would be to tap the door of care people again that, hey, we are a group of six people in first year MBBS. We are interested to do research. Please try to get us connected to a mentor if you don't find a mentor yourself. Care can, for example, tap 10 more people, including myself. And I will tell them, okay, ask the students to come over, we'll have a chat. And if I think I can accommodate them, I can accommodate them. If I think I can refer them to somebody. So it works like this, networking, connection, and and then you do your job. Obviously, um, as you said, in, in a very theoretical manner, that is difficult to get out of the room. There are 500 rooms and which do, door to tap. So you need to build connections. And you have already taken the first step. Uh, as I said, any one of you interested to do research, to do the beginner's research, contact CARE, and CARE can contact me or other people. And from there, I'm sure you'll be connected to the right mentor. All right, thank you. Um, do you think it's more sensible and practical to produce their own um, document of proposal and then present it to a mentor and try to get them involved or already go to like a, a, a project that's already ongoing and try to get into that project? So that's a very, very, I mean, intelligent question, I must say, because uh, so it depends upon the mentor basically. If somebody is already doing research, like myself, I'm publishing and my field of interest is oncology. So I'm doing molecular basis of 
oncology. So I talk about cancer genes and next generation sequencing and all that. So if a student comes to me with a proposal written, say for example, that Dr. Asif, I want to investigate how many people um, in this world have tuberculosis. I'm not interested. So if you have a prefixed proposal written, then there are chances that a mentor will straight away refuse you. Because if you want to work on infectious diseases and I want to work on oncology, we, we are a mismatch. And I will not take any student who is not working in my team. So I think both both the, the you know the defined criteria that you just told, going with the proposal or just going without the proposal, they both work depending upon how the mentor is, what are the priorities of the mentor, how rigid are the students. Say for example, there is a a student who definitely wants to work on tuberculosis and he or she is not ready to listen to anything else then there is no point but if the students are also flexible then i think an initial meeting between the mentor and the students to discuss what you want to do for example this is what i do with my students whenever we meet we talk about it what are your plans so what do you want to work on and if they say we are flexible we will work on whatever you you know give to us as a target and then i tell them that see i work in the field of oncology and i can uh, assign these researches for you and this is what we will do and from there we you know go on so i think it's a good idea to meet the mentor first have a discussion and then draft a proposal and mentors i mean we don't require and we don't expect students coming with a proposal because you guys are just so naive in the field of research, first year or second year students, we don't expect you to you know, have a good proposal written. So don't restrict yourself that we have to write a proposal first and then go to the mentor. Or just tap the door, ask them, WhatsApp them, can, can we have a meeting? And, and it should be that informal, I think. All right, so it's all about the flexibility of both the students and the mentor. But of course, the students have less knowledge and need to be more flexible. Uh, is that right? Yeah, that, that, that is true, yes. Okay, so uh, let's say once we've, we've found a mentor, got into their project, or have started the project, uh, what's the basic tasks that we should expect to be given as juniors? Uh, you're talking about the tasks that you yeah. expected to give? Okay. Again, and the, that's uh, a very broad question and depends upon what the research type is. If it's a survey based research, so the, the majority of the task would be to, you know, get the questionnaire done and then get the questionnaire filled by the students or general population or whatever. If it's a laboratory work, which I doubt that it will be for first year or second year students, then you'll have to spend quite a lot of time in the laboratory. If it is a dry research, database search research or something like that, then it's a home based task. For example, I can share what I do with my students. So with many of the undergraduate students we are working on cancer epidemiology so i design a template of excel sheet i send it to my students and i tell them this is what you have to fill so a good mentor will actually or should actually tell the students exactly what they are supposed to do and that is involving literature search you should be able to do you know good literature search what people have published download articles read the articles develop the understanding and uh, enter the data in the software, for example, Excel or for example, SPSS to a little bit analyze the data. I don't think any mentor will expect students to analyze the whole data set, but some analysis you should be doing. But my, my take home message is that whatever task you are given, take this as a challenge, even if you don't know it, try to learn it because this experience, if you go through the whole cycle of research writing, of research paper, if you complete the whole cycle from the inception of the idea to the publication of the paper, I mean, you will be a different person at the end of the research cycle. You will know each and every step. So it depends what tasks are given to the students. Usually they are not extreme. Usually they are not something which the students cannot do. And always, as I said, if, if there's a good mentor, he or she will guide you. Okay, thank you for that. Um... Now, those were the basic issues that uh, we as CARE as a team could address, uh, could uh, get addressed from Dr. Asif. And as, as we told you before, the questions, uh, the questions are uh, welcome on the WhatsApp group. So now we're on the last 15 minutes of our workshop. So we're gonna move to the questions from the participants. Sure. Uh, so we have one here saying, 
what is the ethical review board and how do we get approved by the ERB? So ethical review board in the university is a review board which uh, kind of reviews every research proposal. So the steps of doing research if you are doing it now university and if it involves patients. That's an important thing. If you are doing any research which involves patient from the Dow University, any of the affiliated hospital, civil hospital or Dow University hospital, so what you need to do is write a proposal and send it to the ethical review board and the members there, including myself, I'm a member there as well. So we review the, the, the proposal and we try to see that you are not doing any harm to the patient. You are not doing any harm to the university data. So if it is ethically sound or not, I mean, we cannot approve a project if somebody says that I'm going to inject, you know, one liter of water in somebody's vein, that sort of thing, you know, you are trying to harm the patient. So this is the responsibility of ethical review board to overview that everything is going on within ethical boundaries. Right. Okay. Uh, well, uh, to the person who asked that, uh, I think that was very comprehensive probably should have answered your question. Uh, now, the next question we have is, what is SP SPSS and wh what's the use of it in research? So uh, I think we had a discussion about this in our earlier conversation that SPSS is basically, it's a social package for statistical analysis uh, used for statistical analysis. It's kind of an Excel sheet where you input your data and that you analyze the data. So it's basically a statistical analysis software which you use for you know analyzing your data and this is one um, one resource one software that i told you is amongst the mandatory requirements uh, if you want to do say for example two or three courses online spss course is one of them and as i said there are five or six videos available on my youtube channel feel free to visit the channel and learn spss okay uh, so our next question is uh, is, is it possible to do research individually or is it necessary to be part of a group? I think it's better to be a part of a group. It's not a mandatory thing to be a part of the group. You can obviously do research independently, but think about it. I mean, um, are you skilled enough? Do you have enough resources? I mean, how are you going to handle if you are alone? So I think that's a self-explanatory question. If you join a research group, you will learn more, you'll be able to contribute more, and obviously you'll acquire more knowledge and skills. Okay, so it's better to uh, get to become a part of a group. Uh, yeah. Someone has asked here um, for a YouTube channel. Um, okay, <laughs> if you're attending the workshop, I don't think you should have asked that, but uh, they're asking for a YouTube channel that can teach SPSS. Uh, Look into Dr. Asif's YouTube channel. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to ask him that. Uh, next question. Uh, how to secure funding and grants? Oh, that, that's way beyond your, um, you know, ambit at the moment and beyond the scope of this uh, short meeting. So this is for the mentors and the PIs. For example, I hold um, quite a lot of national as well as international funding. So there are some funding in grant bodies. For example, Higher Education Commission in Pakistan, they fund researchers. So I've got funding from them. And then there are some international bodies such as Humboldt Foundation or um, and whatnot. I mean, there is USAID. And so what, what you need to do is you submit to them a proposal that this is what my research plan is. This is what I will do. And it has to be a really good research proposal. They review it. And if they deem this fit, on the basis of importance, novelty, and contribution to the society. If they think your project is super duper good on these uh, you know, areas, they give you money to conduct the research because obviously research needs money. So securing funding and grants is the job of the uh, mentor or in research world, we call it principal investigator, PI. PI means principal investigator, and that's the mentor who secures funding. It's not the headache for the students. Okay, uh, all right. After that, we have a very important question. It says, um, when the mentor is not cooperating, is, is there someone we can talk to or are we on our own? <laughs> well, yeah, as I told you, that's the first step to, you know, if you have a good mentor, your life is easy. But if a mentor is a tough guy, I think switch the mentor. It's, it's not something, research is a voluntary act, right? You are doing it voluntarily. You want to publish, you want to, you know, have papers for your own academic growth, as well as to contribute towards the society. So if you find it out in a month's time, or maybe a couple of months time, that it's not working between you and your mentor, switch off. 
you know, change the mentor. That's all. Okay. So basically, you're on your own. Just make good assessments. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. that's so, and, and keep assessing, you know, throughout the process. Right. Okay. Uh, so we have a fairly long question here to... Is it necessary to take part in projects related to the field we're interested in? Would future residency acceptances involve being uh, in researches that are relevant? Um, so, well, yeah, I mean, it helps, for example, if your future target, if the target for your paper publishing is that you get residency in, uh, say, for example, cardiac surgery, so it will help if you have published in, in, in those areas, but program directors internationally, they don't expect undergraduate students to publish, you know, a cardiac surgery paper if he or she is applying for cardiac surgery residency. What they are looking at the CV is, has this student gone through the research exercise? Has this student that research aptitude? So it is fine to publish anywhere, but it should be within the medical curriculum. I mean, I don't want you to publish something on the types of cotton that we have in Pakistan, you know? So that's not gonna fit. So it has to be somewhere within the medical curriculum. If it's in any field related to the medical field, it's fine. Okay, um, our next question is also uh, very interesting and a cause of many fights and arguments. Does the order of names in a research paper matter? Yeah. So, um, yes, it does matter. And um, I will tell you the international norms and I will tell you uh, what I do in my research group. So the international norms are this. The first author is usually the one who has done the largest amount of work inception of the idea, conduction of the experiments, data analysis, and it goes like this. The second author is the one who has done a lot of work, but less than compared to the first author, but obviously more than compared to the third author. And this is how it goes. And the mentor, now, now, now here, is the, here is the catch. Mentor or the supervisor internationally and in my research group are the last authors. The supervisors are the last authors and they are the corresponding author because they correspond with the journal. They write to the journal because they are the team lead. They deal with the journal that this is our paper, we submit the paper and all the reviewing communication that happens between the supervisor, the mentor and the journal. But unfortunately here we have had such examples where the mentor wants to be the first author. And then that's a problem. And this is why it is important to discuss this in the initial phases of your research design with the mentor that what will be the order of um, authorship. And it is fine to talk to the mentor about this. Many students, you know, they get worried, you know, uh, should we talk to the mentor in the very early stages of our research? Do that. Because if you don't do that, then what will happen once you have completed the whole six month cycle and now you come to know that you are not going to be the first author. Now you have lost it, yeah? So it's okay, it's good to discuss these things. Um, the one student who has done most of the work should be the first author. Okay, so yeah, I think you're right. It's very normal here to put the mentors as the first author and um, while well, students watch out, look who you're yeah. talking to. Uh, yes. All right, so uh, our next question here is, what is a research bias and how is it controlled? Research what? Sorry, I miss you. Research bias. So bias is something that you are, uh, you know, um, say for example, I want to study the uh, health of cardiovascular system of individuals. Okay. And I recruit my patients from gym. In the gym, usually you will have people who are fit, who are going there for daily exercises. And now your conclusion is that, well, uh, my research says that cardiovascular problems in Karachi uh, do not exist because everyone in my research is absolutely fit. But that is actually a bias. You collected your samples from the wrong place. Similarly, if you go to, for example, a cardiology ward and you start studying the population there in a cardiology ward of a hospital, everyone will have a cardiovascular problem. So your research findings will be, oh, in Karachi, the cardiovascular problems are very, very, so that's called a research selection bias. This is a bias. So your population of a study should be unbiased, okay? That's what it means. I hope it clarifies. 
Okay. All right. So our next question here is, uh, it's very long. Uh, okay. Is it preferable to start with cross-sectional studies and letters to the editors or meta-analysis? I think um, you should for meta analysis is good. Meta analysis generates level one evidence in medicine. So if you if you are able to do a meta analysis, that's the best thing to do. Best thing, even superior to original articles. It is superior even to research articles. Meta analysis, if you can do it, okay. Um, letters to editor, I mean, they don't count. They don't count in a sense that they, they they're not good for your academic growth purposes. Uh, for faculty, they are not counted for promotion purposes. So I mean, yeah, you can have a couple of letter of editors, but that should not be the main goal. Uh, Cross-sectional studies are good as well, but it should be a research original article or meta analysis. That's you know heavyweight. Okay. Uh, the next one here is uh, is doing research in Pakistan. Uh, is it beneficial for the residency matches in the US? Of course, yes, yes. So the catch here would be that if you, even if you are doing research in Pakistan, publish it in an international journal. So if you publish your research in an international journal, it is acceptable everywhere in the world. So I have a lot of examples. Uh, I secured my postdoctoral fellowship in Germany based on research papers that I published in Pakistan because that was published in international journals. So, so yes, the answer to this question is yes, conditional to the scenario that you publish your research in good international journals. All right. Um, the next one here is, uh, how do we find the gap or novelty if someone doing literature review? Um, that's a difficult thing for, for students to figure out. It sometimes it seems like that whatever topic you pick up for research, it seems like a lot of research has already been done on the same topic. And therefore, students, you know, feel it very difficult to identify the knowledge gap. Now, this is again where the job of the experts come. So internationally, this is how it works. If I'm working in the field of oncology, I am updated on whatever is being published in the field of oncology. So I know, OK, this group is doing that and this group is doing that and this is the research group doing this sort of research and I read journals regularly. So field experts will know that what are the existing knowledge gaps. And again, uh, I think students should always take advice from the mentors identifying the knowledge gaps because I have heard so many students saying, oh, this research has never been done before in the whole world. And I Google it and I find thousands of papers. So students are limited in terms of their knowledge, in terms of their experience. Therefore, for identifying a good knowledge gap, they should always talk to their mentors. Because if you do not identify appropriate knowledge gap, you will not be able to identify appropriate objectives. And if objectives are faulty, your methodology will be faulty. OK, uh, someone has mentioned here that um, we've been told that survey based researches are very hard to get published. Is that true? That is true because that's a very basic side of it. Therefore, I don't conduct any survey based research, for example. So whoever told you this is is partly true. Yes. All right. Now um, we have three minutes left from our our one hour. So we're going to wrap it up here with the questions. Uh, for those of you whose questions couldn't be answered, we are very, very sorry, but um, we're limited by time and uh, uh, Professor Goreshi is also a very busy man. <laughs> so uh, I uh, hope you guys understand. Uh, now, uh, we also have here today the president of CARE. Uh, so I'm just going to invite her over for a few words before we sign out. Uh, would you help, uh, would please? You help, please? Hi, everyone. How are you? Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I am Vijiha Asim, and I am an overseas MBBS student at DIMC, and I'm also the president of CARE. CARE stands for community, the society we live in and we work for it. Awareness to spread and make people aware of what goes around. Respect because that's the foremost principle we live by and empathy because we understand others. CARE is a student society at Dow International Medical College and works towards overcoming the bridge between the elite and the mediocre. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Qureshi for gracing us with his time and presence today. Thank you so much. Um, the insights and actionable steps uh, you gave us today were absolutely fantastic. And I believe those were exactly what our participants were looking for. Secondly, it was an honor to have such a large audience because we have two links simultaneously working. 
We have participants from all over the nation joining us for this workshop. And it was really great to have each and every one of you here with us today. Research is an accelerating and ever-growing topic. We need more people dedicated towards it. Last but not the least, I would like to thank my entire team involved behind today. They're the ones who made it possible. Arib, again, you've met him. He's our host. Thank you very much for your time, Arib. Um, as you all know, whenever a research workshop is conducted, we have certificates are issued. For the certificates, a form will be sent on the WhatsApp group. You are required to fill that form within 30 minutes of the time allotted, just like after the workshop. And once you are verified, you will be allotted. The certificate will be sent to you. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. I look forward to seeing all of you at, fu at future care events and workshops. Please do follow us at the IMC underscore cares on Instagram and let us know what you thought of today. Thank you very much for your time and have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.